Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? He can hear you. It's cutting out a little bit. Okay, we're going to get started. If everybody could find a seat. We're running a little bit late, so we want to go ahead and get started and welcome everybody to our first annual summit for Alaska Native Business Summit. And it's so wonderful to see all of your smiling faces, and we're excited to share a lot of information with you today. And I'm Sherry Beretta. I'm the chairman of the board for Chugash Alaska Corporation. Um, I went to the University of Alaska when it was Anchorage Community College back a long time ago. Um, but um, I'm very excited to be here today, and I want to introduce Rashmi, and he's going to say a couple of things to get us started. <coughs> Thank you, Sherry. My uh, name is Rashmi Prasad. I'm a dean of the College of Business and Public Policy at UAA. Uh, normally in organizations, you start a meeting off with a safety moment. Uh, we're going to start off uh, the meeting with a, a parking moment to, to warn you about parking. So I'm, I've been asked to announce that if people parked in one of the designated lots for this event, if you've parked in one of those lots and you still get a ticket, please contact Sharon Lind and take this down, the phone number, 229-7077. Uh, so just a, a word of welcome. Um, it's wonderful to have uh, all of you here. I'd like to acknowledge uh, the Lieutenant Governor is in transit. He's on his way. So um, Chancellor Case, Provost Gingrich, uh, friends, I'm really honored to welcome uh, all of you to the first annual Alaska Native Business Summit. It's my pleasure to welcome this distinguished group of leaders and scholars to participate in the summit at your university, uh, the University for Alaska. So uh, a word about our summit. Sherry will give you some of the, the history, but for me it started with a question that Sherry posed to me, and that is, how do we prepare for the next 100 years in Alaska? Now she put this question to me at a time this spring when we in Alaska seem to have trouble thinking beyond the next week, much less the next 100 years. But in asking this question, Sherry was also asking uh, whether as a state we can be bold, we can be resilient, and we can be positive in the face of our challenges. The answer is yes. <laughs> Bye. No. <laughs> so thank you, Rashmi. Um, yes, we have had a small working group that have been talking about this, but I wanted to back up just a little bit and um, say that since 2008, when Tom Case, who I'll be introducing shortly to speak, uh, asked me to present at a, a class that he was teaching for master's students in business that were going to be going out into the Alaskan workforce. And it was startling to me the um, level of understanding that these business students had about Alaska Native corporations and the Settlement Act and organizations that um, are really important to the state of Alaska. And so um, I was, at the time, uh, a member of the ANCSA Regional Association that Carl Mars, who will be speaking later, was the, I term the godfather of. <laughs> uh, and I took over as chairman for the second term. Will Anderson served as in the third term, and then Jason Matrokin, who's going to be presenting, served in, in the current term. Um, during that time, the ANCSA Regional Association had focused on education because one of the interesting provisions within the Settlement Act was uh, regarding 7i, land sharing. And the two amendments that have happened to the 7i agreement, one of them was regarding education. So there was a, a, um, a thread that we could all agree on from, from our regional organizations that are somewhat competitive in their operations. And so with that, we were able to focus on um, a resolution with the Board of Regents for the university at that time to look more closely at how Alaska Native corporations could work with the university. So it's been building blocks to where we are today. And uh, our new president, Jim Johnson, uh, worked for Doyon during part of that time and helped to uh, work on the tax credit that we have been able to utilize 
to fund a lot of the uh, um, partnerships that have happened between the university and Alaska Native Corporation. So there are a lot of synergies happening within the um, our, our companies and the university. And so what, what I um, have come to understand too is there's a lot of staff and faculty that really don't understand about Alaska Native Corporations. And so how do we, how do we break down those barriers? How do we start talking about the next hundred years and how we can uh, focus on building a strong economy together? And I think part of it is just getting to know each other and our, our company. So uh, what we've been doing with uh, Chugash Alaska Corporation is looking at not only how we've been able to benefit our shareholders through government contracting, but how we can invest back in the state of Alaska, in our regions. And so I know every region of the 12 regional corporations are doing different things, as well as the village corporations. And, I th and so the idea is that through these presentations that you'll be seeing today, there's an opportunity for the university to develop case studies and white papers where you're teaching the students about Alaska Native corporations that are doing successful work in Alaska. Not that the um, case studies about China and Japan aren't important and relevant, but how wonderful would it be to actually build on the successes that these corporations are having within Alaska, learn about the failures, and try to work together to overcome that and have a, a stronger financial picture into the future. So that's, um, that's kind of the, uh oh, did I shut this off? <laughs> I guess I'm done. Um, but th those are just the thoughts that I wanted to share with you. Um, and Rashmi's going to step in and talk about um, the next thing. Yes, uh, so we, <laughs> we, have, uh, we have students in the audience today. We have students from Sharon Lynn's course on Alaska Native Corporations. So, just want to alert you to that. And also, uh, after each speaker has presented, there'll be an opportunity for questions. So please give the students the first opportunity to ask a question. So this is, in fact, an educational experience uh, in addition uh, today. So uh, the first uh, person I'd like to introduce, uh, acknowledge the person who's going to be uh, facilitating the group exercise later is Bill Dan, Bill Dan of Professional Growth Systems. Uh, he's contributing his time uh, to this important event, and Bill will be the facilitator at 4.30. So Bill, could you stand up and be recognized? So uh, just a, a word about Bill and, and his, his organization. Uh, Professional Growth System started in 1970 to, amiss, uh, to assist emerging native health corporations in rural Alaska take responsibility for providing their own health care, and today is a premier organizational consulting resource for executives governing boards and management teams throughout the United States, PGS has grown to include a client base in many diverse industry sectors, including Alaska Native Corporation. So Bill will be helping us uh, later this afternoon. Now, uh, next person um, on the uh, schedule today is Provost Gingrich. Our Provost, uh, Dr. Sam Gingrich, was appointed Provost and Executive Vice Chancellor at the University of Alaska Anchorage in 2015, January of 2015. Provost Gingrich and his staff have worked to make today's meeting possible. He looks forward to strong partnerships with Alaska Native Corporations. We're pleased to have Provost Gingrich with us today. So Provost Gingrich, please. Uh, thank you. It's truly a pleasure to be part of this uh, event. Uh, and as I uh, applauded uh, Rashmi as we walked in, as you noted, everywhere it says this is the first annual. And I like that claim. I love optimism. Uh, in some ways, it's part of, part of what we're about because the commitment is being made. This is the first annual. And for this to be the first annual, next year there will be a second annual. And then uh, hopefully this will, this will play, uh, play forward. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here really representing the uh, academic community at UAA as both uh, Rashmi and Sherry have uh, laid out their views for this. You know, in some ways, this is where the University for Alaska actually captures or best reflects its mission. Uh, we on the academic side of the shop know we uh, far too often can, uh, if I may, keep the, our expertise within the sterile walls of our uh, classroom because theory works really well in, in classrooms. 
Uh, it's when theory hits the real world sometimes that good things begin to happen because that's when uh, we actually find out what uh, impacts, what benefits uh, are possible. And uh, through that process, if I may, uh, students really can learn and faculty really can learn, administrators can learn, organizations can learn. And so it's, it's that uh, interface between the University for Alaska and uh, groups like this that are really part of what, uh, what the University of Alaska is about. So I want, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome all of you here today and I want to thank you for uh, your commitment and I especially want to uh, welcome the students because as has been pointed out, this is the start of a conversation for what Alaska is going to be 100 years from now, uh, not just today. And uh, we are talking about uh, your world, so thank you very much for being part of this. Thank you. At this time, I would like to introduce Tom Case, who, as I mentioned earlier, was one of the catalysts for bringing it to my attention to the, the need for us to work close, more closely and develop relationships. And through those relationships, Sharon Lind, who I, I just have to um, recognize her, she has been just uh, active She's an activator. She just makes things happen. She's put together so much of this. I, I want to recognize Irene Rowan, who is not here, who was, is also an activator. She has, was a catalyst in, in making this happen. Um, the lieutenant governor, who's on his way here, also pushed the, these things, as well as Carl. So I want to recognize that it takes people keeping things going. It could be an idea, but unless you have people to make things happen, it doesn't happen. So. Thank you, Sharon, for all of your hard work. Sharon is a professor here, and her students are here. Um, so before I um, introduce Tom, I just wanted to say that, that I, I really appreciate all the hard work that she's done in, in putting this event together. So Tom Case has served as Chancellor of the University of Alaska Anchorage since May of 2011, focusing on UA's core mission of serving the higher education needs of the state, its communities, and its diverse peoples. Under Case's leadership, UA improved campus facilities for students and community, including a new health science building, the Alaska Airlines Center, now home of UA's Seawolves, as well as community concerts and special events and the new engineering and industry building and a pedestrian sky bridge spanning Providence Drive. Wow, you've been busy. <laughs> <laughs> U.S. News and World Report rank UAA in the top 20% of schools in its 2015 Best Online Programs for Master's Degree in Education. Seawolf Debate is ranked 6th in the U.S. and 17th in the world in university debating. The College of Business and Public Policy's Experimental Economics Program ranked in the top 10% worldwide by RECEC. -E -C. The School of Nursing ranked number three on America's Best Nursing Schools in the West, and UA is recognized by the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching, one of a select number of colleges and universities to receive this recognition. So after retiring from the Air Force as Lieutenant General, Case was appointed Dean of UA's College of Business and Public Policy, where he served nearly six years before becoming President and Chief Operating Officer of the state-owned, independently operated Alaska Aerospace Corp. A graduate of the U.S. Air Force Academy, Case earned a Master's of Science degree in Systems Management at the University of Southern California, Los Angeles. He is a graduate of the National War College, U.S. Army Command, and General Staff College, War Air, excuse me, Air War College and Emory University's Advanced Management Program. An active mem member of the community, Case has served on the boards of the Alaska World Affairs Council and World Trade Center Alaska and is a past president of Commonwealth North. He recently was elected to a three-year term as commissioner for the Northwest Commission on Colleges and Universities one of six regional nonprofit organizations the U.S. Department of Education recognizes for accrediting post-secondary institutions within the United States. Case married his wife, Susan, 46 years ago. The couple has a daughter, Donna, 
son-in-law Daniel and four grandchildren. He is an avid pilot and of course an enthusiastic Seawolf fan. Let's give him a big round of applause. Well, I am uh, overwhelmed by that generous introduction. Thank you, thank you, Sherry. Uh, and I was really pleased to hear the acknowledgement of our students here and not to be repetitive, but can I ask our students to stand up? Okay, thank you, thank you. As, as you can well imagine, I agree entirely. Okay, am I still on? Um, agree entirely with uh, Regent Beretta's uh, valuing of education. And education comes in so many ways. It comes from book learning and lectures a little bit, but real education happens by doing. And for our students who are here today, you are engaged in that doing. And so I, I really uh, appreciate what you do in that regard. Um, I also want to thank uh, Regent Beretta and I, I think of uh, Regent Beretta as, as a regent, um, as an alumna, as a friend, uh, and a leader in Chugach, Alaska. Many, many hats that you wear, and all of them done very well. Uh, and Chugach, Alaska, I well remember and appreciate uh, how instrumental uh, they've been in developing the Alaska uh, Native Organizational Management Program, and with their philanthropic um, support to many organizations that advance education. And I want to go down a, a short list that I, I need to share with you. Uh, we have an accredited 18 credit minor in Alaska Native Business Management that was launched in the fall of 2014. Uh, currently we have eight students who are declared in that major. This fall the introductory class uh, for the minor is, uh, is at capacity. Uh, we've also had a lasting and productive partnership with KPMG, uh, working very closely uh, with their managing director, Daniel Mitchell. So thank you, Daniel. Um, for this new direction, the College of Business and Public Policy um, has put together uh, a very impressive team of outside advisors. I think I'm going to do away with this. It's cutting in and out um, and speak loudly. Um, in a way that's very, very helpful. Uh, very proud that Sherry uh, Breda is on the uh, chair of the advisory committee and, and is co-chairing uh, co uh, this summit. And I also want to acknowledge and thank everybody who is taking time out from other important things uh, like the uh, uh, Alaska Native uh, Convention that's going on here this week. Uh, to be here and we're continuing to to push this uh, effort forward um, including hosting the fourth annual Alaska Native Studies Conference this spring uh, and that typically uh, has had an audience of over 300 uh, people from really all over the world who, co who come here uh, for that. Uh, I also want to uh, acknowledge uh, uh, Jean Brennick uh, as the uh, newly created position of Interim Associate uh, Vice Chancellor for Alaska Natives and Diversity. And Sharon, thank you for being here. <laughs> An advisor to the, uh, to the Provost uh, on Alaska Natives and Diverse Curriculum and Research and also an advisor to me in, in many, many ways. Appreciate that, uh, that good work. Uh, and she's one of the first tenure track uh, Alaska Native professors hired at UA, uh, arriving in August of 1995. So you have taken us far and uh, more yet to come. So thanks again for everybody from the community who's here. We have community leaders from all walks here. And this is such an important topic and important time. Mention was made of the uh, a great looking campus, and it is. And it's a testament, in my view, to the hard work of generations that came before us in advocating and planning and supporting uh, these projects. Because as you know, capital projects take a long time. So many people can take 
credit for that. I, I only happen to be at the right place at the right time for uh, many of these to come together. But the campus does look great. And that is a real advantage for us in providing the kind of a learning environment that our students can really thrive in. And they appreciate that. I mean, our new engineering and industry building uh, is a big step forward for us. We've renovated much of the College of Arts and Science uh, spaces, you know, as well as Conical Phillips Integrated Science Building. And every part of campus now is, is really in good shape. And so our job, even in these times, is to keep that up and to provide that venue for our students really to excel and, and work hard. And I, I believe that is a factor there. So uh, I'm to introduce uh, uh, Lieutenant Governor Byron Malott when he arrives. He is in transit, so we'll delay that uh, until he arrives. But thank you again for being here. Thank you for all you do. So we're going to go ahead and, and move on to the next presenter. Um, and he really needs no introduction, but uh, Willie Hensley is a distinguished visiting professor in the College of Business and Public Policy at UAA. He retired from Alieska Pipeline Service Company where he served as manager of federal government relations in Washington, D.C. for nine years. He has been and continues to be an advocate for all Alaskans and has served in many roles throughout his career of service to the state of Alaska. We're pleased that Willie is with us today to answer the question, why Yingsa? Willie, oh, and here's Byron. Hi, Byron. <laughs> Willie. You guys are going to have to leg wrestle. See who goes first. We're, there's Willie. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Tom? <laughs> well, thank you. I was offered the great honor of, of introducing Lieutenant Governor Malad, and it's my real pleasure to do that. Uh, I'd like to start by sharing something you may or may not know. He is the uh, owner and pilot of a no kidding flying boat. Have you had that airboard lately, Byron? Not lately, okay, but that's a, that's a feat of, of aeronautical accomplishment that I greatly admire and, and enjoyed the story that goes with it. But it is my distinct uh, honor to introduce Governor, uh, Lieutenant Governor Malott, uh, who began his public service in his ancestral home out at Yakutat, Alaska, and talk about an early starter. He was elected mayor at age 22, so got an early start in this business and later served as a mayor in Juneau. Uh, his start in public uh, leadership has grown into a deep and unique knowledge base of all aspects of Alaskan life, uh, and a length of accomplishments too long to, to be complete, but served as president of the Alaska Federation of Natives, executive director of the Alaska Permanent Fund Corporation, co-chair of the Commission on Rural Governance and Empowerment, Chair of the Nature Conservancy of Alaska, and President and CEO of the First Alaskans Institute and Sea Alaska Corporation. Byron and his wife, Tony, have five children, nine grandchildren, and one great-grandchild. So, Byron, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the podium. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Chancellor. Thank you, Dean. Um, thank you, Senator Hensley. The, uh, the place of native business in Alaska is one that there was a time we didn't really contemplate. There was a time when we scrambled to determine for ourselves the definition of corporation and what it meant. There was a time when we had, when the land claims potential with the discovery of Prudhoe Bay 
suddenly grew from tens of millions to billions, and the potential for significant land in retained native ownership suggested to the Congress that these Alaska natives ought to come before us and explain what might be their capacity to take responsibility for a settlement of consequential size. And I recall that we had to scramble. We asked several native jet captains who came to Washington with their four-striped uniforms as a demonstration of success in the Alaska Native community. <clears throat> uh, an example like that would be as relevant today as it was then. And possibly if we had thought about it, uh, uh, and I guess we did because we asked them to come to Washington and they did, of given opportunity, we probably could achieve much, both on an individual and hopefully collective basis. <clears throat> We asked a gentleman named Cecil Barnes, who was one of our native leaders at the time, to come back and testify at that hearing on whether or not we had the capacity to conduct our own affairs because he had that most American definition of success. He was in debt. He had a home mortgage, and he, again, really amongst us, was among a few native homeowners uh, that understood the banking system and was able to uh, get a mortgage and, and uh, meet the requirements. I think we also brought back a judge uh, no, he was an attorney then, Roy Madsen. Huh? Uh, uh, but the point is that fast forward 40 years and a few, and we're in a very different place, aren't we? The university itself is in a very different place. So the opportunity for the university as an institution of both learning, research, and societal expression and change in our state is at a level that <clears throat> I believe many, if not most of us, uh, back then would not have contemplated. Certainly, the place of the Alaska Native community after ANGSA and how far we've come in 40 years, I think we had hints of a sense that there was something out there that was significant that we had to aspire to. Uh, but I think then that if anyone had said, today we would have the number of attorneys, Joe, uh, uh, MBAs, doctors, lawyers, uh, engineers, Herb, with the kind of leadership that has come from the university, uh, that we would have business leaders with MBAs from the university, that we would have returning 
younger Native Alaskans having experienced life outside the state uh, and competed effectively, responsibly, come home with much success in order to advance and be involved with their own institutions. It would have taken Willie a late night at the Montana Club <laughs> to dream of these kinds of possibilities. <laughs> the, uh, the reality that we have today just begs for leadership. It begs for the university, the Native community at large, the Alaska Native business community, the business community at large, to come together in ways to accelerate, to magnify, to use the tools that society, Alaska, has made available to the university over these many years. The result of the Land Claims Settlement Act and the work that Native leadership has put into making the corporations, the uh, engines of the Alaskan economy that they are today. But even if we speak in terms of success and achievement, uh, I think we all believe, both within our institutions, in the university, and I think even across the state, uh, that these engines of success have really not yet hit their stride that we, in many ways, are just emerging, that we are shedding this, this cocoon that sheltered us as embryos, that the ability to, to move and fly the ability to, to transcend, the ability to make common cause with so much else in our society in order to make Alaska a good place for every single one of us. To create opportunity in our own places for Native peoples to be able to look out across their own lands where their people have lived for millennia and reinvigorate those places for a future also of success and opportunity for children and grandchildren. To be able to be a significant element of making Alaska a really good place for every single Alaskan. We had a session this morning with tribes down at AFN and AFN uh, down at Egan Center. And <clears throat> Commissioner of Education read the statutory uh, requirement for education achievement in Alaska. And we kind of read it as education leading to jobs. And most people put a full stop on that phrase end it with a period, but if you read the entire obligation put on the state of Alaska, it is essentially to create Alaskans, not create, I'm taking the embryonic 
vision too far. Uh, <laughs> yes, to create the opportunity for every person who comes through the Alaskan education system and process to be able to give, the words aren't there exactly, but they mean the same, to give back, to create Alaskans who can make Alaska a better place all the time. And if we do that through opportunities like this, our university, our native corporations, the economic uh, leadership of our state combined with the in intellectual leadership, combined with the full range of other leadership in our state, this will be a really good place and I commend your efforts uh, uh, to continue the work in that direction. Uh, and if I can help uh, Dean, Chancellor, others here, I look forward to that opportunity and, and uh, wish you the very best in your uh, discussions and ongoing work that you're creating here today. Thank you. Very inspiring. Um, so what I said about Willie earlier, <laughs> same thing. <laughs> Willie and um, Byron, Lieutenant Governor Malott, were, um, you know, I've seen pictures of you guys when you were young going back to D.C. and you guys were young. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you, you, you were, you know, back there talking to senators and, and really moving and shaking in a time that um, was just unknown. And so we really just want to thank you for all your efforts, both of you. And um, I'd like to welcome Willie up to talk about why Anxa. I'd like to collect, correct uh, Byron's uh, record here. Ariga kuyurungo University of Alaska me. Thankfully, throughout all this academic effort uh, from the Bureau of Indian Affairs all the way through the university, uh, George Washington. I never quite let go of the language. Uh, I don't, I'd love to be more fluent than I am, but as you know, uh, it, it was the job of the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the system to ensure that we didn't know anything of our identity, of our language, of our values, of our music, our art, uh, the knowledge. And so it, it's a wonder that it has survived. And what I said was, my name is Rarug. I was named for my grandfather. as a which means I'm from Kotzebue, a little island guy. And then uh, I'm also a saltwater person, which is important in our culture uh, because uh, we get our sustenance from the sea. Um, anyway, um, I, don't, I don't have a prepared statement, but uh, I know there are a lot of experts on land claims out there and also on the corporations. Uh, but um, what I do, do want to say is to thank uh, uh, Dr. Prasad and uh, Chancellor Case uh, for having me be on campus the last uh, few years, uh, teaching a couple of graduate courses. It, it, it's given me the time to read and research and learn more. Uh, because so many of us really don't know much about the space that we're in. Um, and it's fascinating. Uh, the, the history, the thousands of years of history, you know, the, the era of uh, colonization, uh, 
both by the Russians and then by the Americans and the various adjustments that uh, we had to try to make uh, in our existence up here. And in a way, I see it as a bit uh, like invasive species. You know, when you have a, an invasive species, whether it's a bird or a plant, uh, show up in an area, the indigenous species have to make their adjustments in order to survive. And that's what we've had to do for a long, long time. And uh, <clears throat> don't we have any technicians here, for God's sake? <laughs> All right, I'll keep trying. Um, anyway, um, maybe I'll just speak from back here. Can you hear me OK? Uh, okay, this is much better. Um, uh, most of us are products of the boarding school system. Byron is, I am, I don't know about Carl. But uh, you know, those boarding schools were repressive systems that took us away from home, from family, um, our foods, everything that was a, a value to us that we loved, and it essentially attempted to cut off that connection. That's the job of a colonial power. And that's happened to us. So <clears throat> it's not as if colonization was like 200 years ago. That's not the case at all. And in fact, it's in a sense ongoing. We're still having to make our adjustments. Um, and uh, uh, it's a wonder that our spirits have survived let alone any traditional skills that we might have had to learn to make our livelihood. Uh, but we persisted. And we all tried to make our adjustments to learn the academic skills that uh, we were told were essential. But you know, going back as far as Sheldon Jackson, you know, it was pretty clear in his mind what the role of the educational system was going to be. It was to make the indigenous people the working force for the emerging white majority. That was the goal. And uh, whatever it took to get that accomplished is uh, what his obligation was. And so we, we're still working through the fact that he essentially turned our children over to the churches, where they were essentially arms of the government that made it illegal for us to use our own languages in the classroom or in the, in the playground. Um, they quickly began to change our names and to try to do away with every institution, every practice that knitted our societies together. And, and the sad truth is that almost every ship that came by had germs that we could not contend with. And so historically there's been wave upon wave upon wave <coughs> of smallpox, chickenpox, influenza, diphtheria, whooping cough, wiping out our people. And so, um, insofar as <laughs> the question about why ANXA, well, our people covered the entire state of Alaska. When you fly over it, it looks like it's empty territory, but the reality is that that territory belonged to some group, and they fought like crazy to keep control of that space because it was essential for their survival. The further north you went out of the Aleutians, the more space it took. The Aleutians were loaded with protein. They had 17 to 20,000 people in a tremendous society out there. The further north you went, the more spread out we had to be to make our livelihood. And Alaska is a hard place to live without oil. Because oil is the only thing that's left anything behind of any real value. And uh, the sad truth is that we really had very little to do with uh, the idea of statehood. Um, it, it's, a, it's a traditional American approach. As soon as the indigenous people are under control, then the ones who move in there petition the Congress for a state. And that's what they did. And we probably supported it because we were pretty well in the grip of the, you know, of the system by then. 
But what we didn't know, and I didn't know, until I actually got out of college at George Washington University, was that that act was sort of the beginning of the death knell of our, any control of our space in our land. That 104 million acres or so that Congress promised the state was essentially our land. And our, and our, and our underlying aboriginal title, Indian title, had, had never been extinguished. They had the opportunity during the fight for statehood, but they managed to stick in there the uh, clause uh, that sort of preserved the status quo. That is the, what was it called? Come on. The, 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 <laughs> the, uh, the, the, dis the disclaimer clause that said that the state, dis the state disclaimed title to native lands. But the problem was going back till 1887, or 1887 when they passed the Allotment Act, they, they, never, they never defined what native lands were. <coughs> and for, for sure, the Russians uh, could never have had sovereignty because there never were more than 800 of them here at any one time. We were victims of this notion of discovery, right? This European notion that a few, a few, non, a few Europeans show up in this vast, vast territory most of which they never ever saw, said was theirs. Of course, we were out there doing our thing. We, most, there are parts of Alaska where they, they never knew the Russians were here, I suspect. <laughs> yeah. But nonetheless, they sold their right to the United States in 1867. And many people don't realize that between 1867 and 1924, we had no rights. We we're not citizens. They, they, they passed the Organic Act to give the non-natives the right to file the mining claims, but not the Indians. So that, that was the situation uh, that we were in, uh, <clears throat> you know, at that, at that period of time. So we, until 1924, with the Indian the passage of the Indian Citizenship Act, uh, we essentially were countryless. We are citizens of our own groups. And so uh, when, when I left George Washington in in, in the winter of 66, uh, in spite of having been through grade school in Alaska, boarding school in Tennessee, you know, two years at the University of Alaska, three and a half years and <laughs> trying to get out of Georgia, Washington, I, I really was completely in the dark, like, like most Alaska Natives, about anything regarding how we fit into the system. I d we didn't understand the nature of our of our our legal status as Alaska Natives, let alone what other rights we might have to the land. And so some of you remember Etuk, Charlie Edwardson, he just passed away this spring out on the ice. Well, Etuk was a brilliant SOB. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and, and he, he, he was a stutterer. He couldn't express himself, and he got really angry, and he was brilliant, and he learned from the Clinkets about land claims and about the law, and he convinced his own people that they should file their claim because when the state made a, a claim for the land under the Statehood Act, when they filed uh, for, a, say, a half a million acre section, uh, if you had a, a, um, a, a homestead, you know, you had a provision you could protest the state selection, but we had nothing like that for the native people. So we had to create one. We had to create a claim that was not envisioned in the, in the, uh, in the, uh, in the Statehood Act. But, uh, but Etuk uh, helped convince his people to file a claim in January of 66, so they claimed all the North Slope. Well, he, he called me, we chatted, we had a few beers at the Imperial Bar in Juneau, where he was working as a as a doorman for Senator um, uh, Congress uh, Chairman uh, Speaker of the House Mike Gravel, who gave him this job, and so so uh, so that's how I in a sense we ended up with two regions up there, you know, they said oh Willie will take care of his area, <laughs> and so in reality I didn't know what the hell I was supposed to do because I didn't understand the history, 
But the University of Alaska gave me the chance to study it when I took the course from Jay Rubinowitz and began to look at the history and the law and the regulations and the practices and how they tried to compensate Native people uh, through the Court of Claims and to the Indian Claims Commission. And when I got done with it, there were two things I realized. Number one, we still had Indian title. That was a big aha moment because, because the moment the Secretary of Interior signed a request for land by the state, boom, it was going to be gone and we were never going to get it back except maybe a few cents an acre through the Court of Claims or the Indian Claims Commission. I, when I, I realized that and I knew that we had to stop it, we had to stop that process, the state selection process. And, uh, and here we were. We, we had no organization. We had no money. We had no attorneys at that particular time. And we really had to start from ab absolute scratch. And, uh, and every, every, every region has its story. Uh, I borrowed $10 from Hen Harry, Punnick, Harry Punnick in Fairbanks to buy stamps, to send 11 villages a letter saying, we got a problem. We got to file a land claim. Of course, it was in English, and, and we had no media, we had no TV, we had no radio, and we had no telephones. And all they could do with that letter, that uh, Ruby Tansy from Cantwell and uh, Reva Wolf from Shagla helped me write. We use those old timey typewriters <laughs> with, with the carbon copies. You remember those? <laughs> so the only thing that they could do with that four-page letter was to take it to the post office in the store or the <coughs> trading post. But that's what got Nana started. That was enough to get us going to file, file our land claim. And, you know, thank God we're in America. Because if the Russians had kept us, <laughs> there would be no settlement because over there everybody is a Russian and the, all the land belongs to Putin or <laughs> the Tsar. <laughs> Really. I mean, but the reality was we were, we were at the 11th hour. I mean, it, because our land was about to be taken. And had we not woken up to that fact, we would, we would now be in the Court of Claims or the Claims Commission trying to get a few cents an acre, and we wouldn't have a single parcel of land to call our own. When I looked at the Clink and Haida case and how they had spent 35 years or so in the Court of Claims and had, had emerged with only seven and a half million dollars, after all that time, and not a square inch of land in, in some of the most beautiful country in Alaska, I thought, we have to come up with something new because it was not going to work for us. And so that's, in reality, uh, the realization that we all came to in, in, in January or October of 1966, 49 years ago, right about now. And that, that little paper that I wrote that, that Etook had copied and distributed really was just an expression of what our people already felt about the land. You can't not be <coughs> affected by land that you've been on for 10,000 years. You're connected to it. And so it was a, it was a last ditch attempt to, uh, to get some equity. And, uh, uh, but we came this close to losing it all. And the, the, the truth is that if the state wasn't willing to deal, and I'll tell you, Wally Hickel was no shrinking violet when he became governor. <laughs> he was going to run over us one way or the other. You know, because that was his job, right? To represent people of the state. And our job was to fight like hell for our land. And uh, so, but the state came along. And uh, ten, 10 billion barrels of oil helps. And then the other thing was if the natives didn't get along, if we weren't together, it wasn't going to happen either. Congress wasn't going to act. But so, I know she's trying to shut me up. <laughs> I, have one more, I have one more point to make. When it comes to the corporation, and people are mystified by where it came from, but 
in trying to get Wally Hickel and the state on board, we got him to appoint the entire AFN board onto the Rural Affairs Commission. The Rural Affairs Commission created a, a drafting committee. I chaired that committee. We came up with a state report to the legislature recommending that the state uh, do several things. In that was the notion of revenue sharing. In there was the notion of modern forms of, of, of management or governance. And so those ideas came out of the AFN, in a sense, through the drafting committee, and it was made a part of the uh, state record. Most people don't know about that. And those ideas uh, kind of emerged in Washington. Um, and uh, today we have you know, the corporate tribal issue. Well, to me, if we had tried to solve the problem of governance, between the tribes and the state at that point, that, that was, th th our land would have been gone. I mean, we'd never have solved that issue. And so in a sense, we took the path of least resistance in order to get that land. And so it's up to your generation, Jason and others, to come up with that solution. There is no reason why the corporations and the tribes can't work together, in my opinion. Thank you.